Braina Euro Computer Interface, Wikipedia Article Audio A Braina Euro Computer Interface, sometimes called a Neural Control Interface, Mind Machine Interface, Direct Neural Interface, or Braina Euro Machine Interface, is a direct communication pathway between an enhanced or wired brain and an external device. BCI differs from neuromodulation in that it allows for bidirectional information flow. GIs are often directed at researching, mapping, assisting, augmenting, or repairing human cognitive or sensory motor functions. Research on BGIs began in the 1970s at the University of California, Los Angeles under a grant from the National Science Foundation followed by a contract from DARPA. The papers published after this research also mark the first appearance of the expression Brain a Euro Computer Interface in scientific literature. History Versus Neuroprosthetics The field of BCI research and development has since focused primarily on neuroprosthetics applications that aim at restoring damaged hearing, sight, and movement. Thanks to the remarkable cortical plasticity of the brain, signals from implanted prostheses can, after adaptation, be handled by the brain like natural sensor or effector channels. Following years of animal experimentation, the first neuroprosthetic devices implanted in humans appeared in the mid-1990s. The history of Brain a Euro computer interfaces starts with Hans Berger's discovery of the electrical activity of the human brain and the development of electroencephalography. In 1924, Berger was the first to record human brain activity by means of EEG. Berger was able to identify oscillatory activity, such as Berger's wave or the alpha wave, by analyzing EEG traces. Berger's first recording device was very rudimentary. He inserted silver wires under the scalps of his patients. These were later replaced by silver foils attached to the patient's head by rubber bandages. Berger connected these sensors to a Lippmann capillary electrometer, with disappointing results. However, more sophisticated measuring devices, such as the Siemens double-coil recording galvanometer, which displayed electric voltages as small as one ten-thousandth of a volt, led to success. Berger analyzed the interrelation of alternations in his EEG wave diagrams with brain diseases. EEGs permitted completely new possibilities for the research of human brain activities. UCLA professor Jacques Vital coined the term BCI and produced the first peer-reviewed publications on this topic. Vital is widely recognized as the inventor of BGIs in the BCI community, as reflected in numerous peer-reviewed articles reviewing and discussing the field. The 1977 experiment Vital described was non-invasive EEG control of a cursor-like graphical object on a computer screen. The demonstration was movement in a maze. Animal BCI Research After his early contributions, Vital was not active in BCI research, nor BCI events such as conferences, for many years. In 2011, however, he gave a lecture in Graz, Austria, supported by the future BNCI project, presenting the first BCI, which earned a standing ovation. Vital was joined by his wife, Larissa Vital, who previously worked with him at UCLA on his first BCI project. In 1988 report was given on non-invasive EEG control of a physical object, a robot. The experiment described was EEG control of multiple start-stop restart of the robot movement, along an arbitrary trajectory defined by a line drawn on a floor. The line following behavior was the default robot behavior, 
utilizing autonomous intelligence and autonomous source of energy. Early work In 1990 report was given on a bidirectional adaptive BCI controlling computer buzzer by an anticipatory brain potential, the contingent negative variation potential. The experiment described how an expectation state of the brain, manifested by CNV, controls in a feedback loop the S2 buzzer in the S1-S2 CNV paradigm. The obtained cognitive wave representing the expectation learning in the brain is named electroexpectogram. The CNV brain potential was part of the BCI challenge presented by Vital in his 1973 paper. In 2015, the BCI Society was officially launched. This non-profit organization is managed by an international board of BCI experts from different sectors with experience in different types of keys, such as invasive slash non-invasive and control slash non-control. The board is elected by the members of the society, which has several hundred members. Among other responsibilities, the BCI Society organizes the international BCI meetings. These major conferences occur every other year and include activities such as keynote lectures, workshops, posters, satellite events, and demonstrations. The next meeting is scheduled in May 2018 at the Asilomar Conference Grounds in Pacific Grove, California. Neuroprosthetics is an area of neuroscience concerned with neural prostheses, that is, using artificial devices to replace the function of impaired nervous systems and brain-related problems, or of sensory organs. The most widely used neuroprosthetic device is the cochlear implant which, as of December 2010, had been implanted in approximately 220,000 people worldwide. There are also several neuroprosthetic devices that aim to restore vision, including retinal implants. Prominent Research Successes The difference between BGIS and neuroprosthetics is mostly in how the terms are used. Neuroprosthetics typically connect the nervous system to a device whereas BGIS usually connect the brain with a computer system. Practical neuroprosthetics can be linked to any part of the nervous system a euro for example, peripheral nervous a euro while the term BCI usually designates a narrower class of systems which interface with the central nervous system. Kennedy and Yang Dan The terms are sometimes, however, used interchangeably. Neuroprosthetics and BGIS seek to achieve the same aims, such as restoring sight, hearing, movement, ability to communicate, and even cognitive function. Both use similar experimental methods and surgical techniques. Nicolaelis Several laboratories have managed to record signals from monkey and rat cerebral cortices to operate BGIS to produce movement. Monkeys have navigated computer cursors on screen and commanded robotic arms to perform simple tasks simply by thinking about the task and seeing the visual feedback, but without any motor output. In May 2008 photographs that showed a monkey at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center operating a robotic arm by thinking were published in a number of well-known science journals and magazines. Other research on cats has decoded their neural visual signals. In 1969 the operant conditioning studies of FETS and colleagues, at the Regional Primate Research Center and Department of Physiology and Biophysics, University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, showed for the first time that monkeys could learn to control the deflection of a biofeedback meter arm with neural activity. 
Similar work in the 1970s established that monkeys could quickly learn to voluntarily control the firing rates of individual and multiple neurons in the primary motor cortex if they were rewarded for generating appropriate patterns of neural activity. Donoghue, Schwartz, and Anderson Studies that developed algorithms to reconstruct movements from motor cortex neurons, which control movement, date back to the 1970s. In the 1980s, Apostolos Georgopoulos at Johns Hopkins University found a mathematical relationship between the electrical responses of single motor cortex neurons in rhesus macaque monkeys and the direction in which they moved their arms. He also found that dispersed groups of neurons, in different areas of the monkeys' brains, collectively controlled motor commands, but was able to record the firings of neurons in only one area at a time, because of the technical limitations imposed by his equipment. There has been rapid development in geese since the mid-1990s. Several groups have been able to capture complex brain motor cortex signals by recording from neural ensembles and using these to control external devices. Philip Kennedy and colleagues built the first intracortical brain a Euro computer interface by implanting neurotrophic cone electrodes into monkeys. In 1999, researchers led by Yang Dan at the University of California, Berkeley decoded neuronal firings to reproduce images seen by cats. The team used an array of electrodes embedded in the thalamus of sharp-eyed cats. Researchers targeted 177 brain cells in the thalamus lateral geniculate nucleus area, which decodes signals from the retina. The cats were shown eight short movies, and their neuron firings were recorded. Using mathematical filters, the researchers decoded the signals to generate movies of what the cats saw and were able to reconstruct recognizable scenes and moving objects. Similar results in humans have since been achieved by researchers in Japan. Miguel Nicolelis, a professor at Duke University, in Durham, North Carolina, has been a prominent proponent of using multiple electrodes spread over a greater area of the brain to obtain neuronal signals to drive a BCI. Other research after conducting initial studies in rats during the 1990s, Nicolaelis and his colleagues developed PGs that decoded brain activity in owl monkeys and used the devices to reproduce monkey movements in robotic arms. Monkeys have advanced reaching and grasping abilities and good hand manipulation skills, making them ideal test subjects for this kind of work. The BCI Award by 2000 the group succeeded in building a BCI that reproduced owl monkey movements while the monkey operated a joystick or reached for food. The BCI operated in real time and could also control a separate robot remotely over internet protocol. But the monkeys could not see the arm moving and did not receive any feedback, a so-called open-loop BCI. 2010 Kuntai Guan, Kai Keng Ang, Karen Sui Jiok Chua and Beng Tiai Ang. Later experiments by Nicolaelis using rhesus monkeys succeeded in closing the feedback loop and reproduced monkey reaching and grasping movements in a robot arm. With their deeply cleft and furrowed brains, rhesus monkeys are considered to be better models for human neurophysiology than owl monkeys. The monkeys were trained to reach and grasp objects on a computer screen by manipulating a joystick while corresponding movements by a robot arm were hidden. The monkeys were later shown the robot directly and learned to control it by viewing its movements. The BCI used velocity predictions to control reaching movements and simultaneously predicted hand gripping force. In 2011 O'Doherty and colleagues showed a BCI with sensory feedback with rhesus monkeys. 
The monkey was brain controlling the position of an avatar arm while receiving sensory feedback through direct intracortical stimulation in the arm representation area of the sensory cortex. Other laboratories which have developed keys and algorithms that decode neuron signals include those run by John Donoghue at Brown University, Andrew Schwartz at the University of Pittsburgh and Richard Anderson at Caltech. These researchers have been able to produce working keys, even using recorded signals from far fewer neurons than did Nicolaelis. Conceptual Issues Obtaining informed consent from people who have difficulty communicating, risk-slash-benefit analysis, shared responsibility of BCI teams, the consequences of BCI technology for the quality of life of patients and their families, side effects, personal responsibility and its possible constraints, issues concerning personality and personhood and its possible alteration, blurring of the division between human and machine, therapeutic applications and their possible exceedance, questions of research ethics that arise when progressing from animal experimentation to application in human subjects, mind reading and privacy, mind control, use of the technology in advanced interrogation techniques by governmental authorities, selective enhancement and social stratification, communication to the media. Donahue's group reported training rhesus monkeys to use a BCI to track visual targets on a computer screen with or without assistance of a joystick. Swartz's group created a BCI for three-dimensional tracking in virtual reality and also reproduced BCI control in a robotic arm. The same group also created headlines when they demonstrated that a monkey could feed itself pieces of fruit and marshmallows using a robotic arm controlled by the animal's own brain signals. Human BCI Research Invasive Keys Vision Movement Anderson's group used recordings of pre-movement activity from the posterior parietal cortex in their BCI, including signals created when experimental animals anticipated receiving a reward. In 2011, Nuum's EEG from www.neuroscan.com was used to study the extent of detectable brain signals from stroke patients who performed motor imagery using BCI in a large clinical trial, and the results showed that majority of the patients could use the BCI. In March 2012 G.Tech introduced the Intendix Speller the first commercially available BCI system for home use which can be used to control computer games and apps. It can detect different brain signals with an accuracy of 99%. Has hosted several workshop tours to demonstrate the Intendix system and other hardware and software to the public, such as a workshop tour of the U.S. West Coast during September 2012. In 2012 an Italian startup company, Liquid Web SRL, released Brain Control, a first prototype of an AAC BCI based, designed for patients in locked-in state. It was validated from 2012 and 2014 with the involvement of LIS and CLIS patients. In 2014 the company introduced the commercial version of the product with the CE Mark Class I as medical device. In addition to predicting kinematic and kinetic parameters of limb movements, keys that predict electromyographic or electrical activity of the muscles of primates are being developed. Such keys could be used to restore mobility in paralyzed limbs by electrically stimulating muscles. Miguel Nicolaelis and colleagues demonstrated that the activity of large neural ensembles can predict arm position. This work made possible creation of keys that read arm movement intentions and translate them into movements of artificial actuators. 
Carmena and colleagues programmed the neural coding in a BCI that allowed a monkey to control reaching and grasping movements by a robotic arm. Lebedev and colleagues argued that brain networks reorganize to create a new representation of the robotic appendage in addition to the representation of the animal's own limbs. The biggest impediment to BCI technology at present is the lack of a sensor modality that provides safe, accurate, and robust access to brain signals. It is conceivable or even likely, however, that such a sensor will be developed within the next 20 years. The use of such a sensor should greatly expand the range of communication functions that can be provided using a BCI. In 2006 Sony patented a neural interface system allowing radio waves to affect signals in the neural cortex, in 2007 Neurosky released the first affordable consumer-based EEG along with the game Neuroboy. This was also the first large-scale EEG device to use dry sensor technology. In 2008 OCZ Technology developed a device for use in video games relying primarily on electromyography. In 2008 the Final Fantasy developer Square Enix announced that it was partnering with Neurosky to create a game, Judica. In 2009 Mattel partnered with Neurosky to release the Mind Flex, a game that used an EEG to steer a ball through an obstacle course. By far the best-selling consumer-based EEG to date, in 2009 Uncle Milton Industries partnered with Neurosky to release the Star Wars Force Trainer, a game designed to create the illusion of possessing the Force, in 2009 Emotive released the EPOC, a 14-channel EEG device that can read four mental states, 13 conscious states, facial expressions, and head movements. The EPOC is the first commercial BCI to use dry sensor technology, which can be dampened with a saline solution for a better connection. In November 2011, Time magazine selected Nikomimi, produced by Neuroware, as one of the best inventions of the year. The company announced that it expected to launch a consumer version of the garment consisting of cat-like ears controlled by a brainwave reader produced by Neurosky, in spring 2012, in February 2014 They Shall Walk began a partnership with James W. Shakerji on the development of a wireless BCI, in 2016, a group of hobbyists developed an open-source BCI board that sends neural signals to the audio jack of a smartphone, dropping the cost of entry-level BCI to a pound two zero. Basic diagnostic software is available for Android devices, as well as a text entry app for Unity. Development and implementation of a BCI system is complex and time-consuming. In response to this problem, Gerwin Schock has been developing a general-purpose system for BCI research, called BCI-2000. BCI-2000 has been in development since 2000 in a project led by the Brain a Euro Computer Interface R&D program at the Wadsworth Center of the New York State Department of Health in Albany, New York, United States. A new wireless approach uses light-gated ion channels such as channel rhodopsin to control the activity of genetically defined subsets of neurons in vivo. In the context of a simple learning task, illumination of transfected cells in the somatosensory cortex influenced the decision-making process of freely moving mice. The use of BMIs has also led to a deeper understanding of neural networks and the central nervous system. Research has shown that despite the inclination of neuroscientists to believe that neurons have the most effect when working together, single neurons can be conditioned through the use of BMIs to fire at a pattern that allows primates to control motor outputs. 
The use of BMIs has led to development of the single neuron insufficiency principle which states that even with a well-tuned firing rate single neurons can only carry a narrow amount of information and therefore the highest level of accuracy is achieved by recording firings of the collective ensemble. Other principles discovered with the use of BMIs include the neuronal multitasking principle, the neuronal mass principle, the neural degeneracy principle, and the plasticity principle. Partially invasive BGEs BGEs are also proposed to be applied by users without disabilities. A user-centered categorization of BCI approaches by Torsten Ozander and Christian Koth introduces the term passive BCI. Next to active and reactive BCI that are used for directed control, passive keys allow for assessing and interpreting changes in the user state during human-computer interaction. In a secondary Implicit control loop the computer system adapts to its user improving its usability in general. The annual BCI Research Award is awarded in recognition of outstanding and innovative research in the field of brain-computer interfaces. Each year, a renowned research laboratory is asked to judge the submitted projects. The jury consists of world-leading BCI experts recruited by the awarding laboratory. The jury selects 12 nominees, then chooses a first, second, and third place winner, who receive awards of $3,000, $2,000, and $1,000, respectively. The following list presents the first place winners of the annual BCI Research Award. Invasive BCI research has targeted repairing damaged sight and providing new functionality for people with paralysis. Invasive BGEs are implanted directly into the gray matter of the brain during neurosurgery. Because they lie in the gray matter, invasive devices produce the highest quality signals of BCI devices but are prone to scar tissue buildup, causing the signal to become weaker or even non-existent, as the body reacts to a foreign object in the brain. Non-invasive keys Non-EG-based Humana Euro Computer Interface Pupil Size Oscillation In vision science, direct brain implants have been used to treat non-congenital blindness. One of the first scientists to produce a working brain interface to restore sight was private researcher William Dobley. Dobley's first prototype was implanted into Jerry, a man blinded in adulthood, in 1978. A single array BCI containing 68 electrodes was implanted onto Jerry a Euro trademark S visual cortex and succeeded in producing phosphenis the sensation of seeing light. The system included cameras mounted on glasses to send signals to the implant. Initially, the implant allowed Jerry to see shades of grey in a limited field of vision at a low frame rate. This also required him to be hooked up to a mainframe computer, but shrinking electronics and faster computers made his artificial eye more portable and now enable him to perform simple tasks unassisted. In 2002, Jens Naumann, also blinded in adulthood, became the first in a series of 16 paying patients to receive Dobley a Euro trademark S second generation implant, marking one of the earliest commercial uses of keys. The second-generation device used a more sophisticated implant enabling better mapping of phosphenis into coherent vision. Phosphenis are spread out across the visual field in what researchers call the starry night effect. Immediately after his implant, Jens was able to use his imperfectly restored vision to drive an automobile slowly around the parking area of the research institute. Unfortunately. Dobley died in 2004 before his processes and developments were documented. Subsequently, 
when Mr. Nauman and the other patients in the program began having problems with their vision, there was no relief and they eventually lost their sight again. Nauman wrote about his experience with Dobley's work in Search for Paradise, a patient's account of the artificial vision experiment and has returned to his farm in southeast Ontario, Canada, to resume his normal activities. Gies focusing on motor neuroprosthetics aim to either restore movement in individuals with paralysis or provide devices to assist them such as interfaces with computers or robot arms. Researchers at Emory University in Atlanta, led by Philip Kennedy and Roy Bakke, were first to install a brain implant in a human that produced signals of high enough quality to simulate movement. Their patient, Johnny Ray, suffered from a Euro locked in syndrome a Euro trademark after suffering a brain stem stroke in 1997. Ray a Euro trademark S implant was installed in 1998 and he lived long enough to start working with the implant, eventually learning to control a computer cursor, he died in 2002 of a brain aneurysm. Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy Tetraplegic Matt Nagel became the first person to control an artificial hand using a BCI in 2005 as part of the first nine-month human trial of Cyberkinetics A Euro Trademark S Brain Gate Chip Implant. Implanted in Naglia Euro Trademark S Right Precentral Gyrus, the 96 electrode brain gate implant allowed Nagel to control a robotic arm by thinking about moving his hand as well as a computer cursor, lights, and TV. One year later, Professor Jonathan Walpole received the prize of the Altran Foundation for Innovation to develop a brain computer interface with electrodes located on the surface of the skull, instead of directly in the brain. More recently, Research teams led by the BrainGate Group at Brown University and a group led by University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, both in collaborations with the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, have demonstrated further success in direct control of robotic prosthetic limbs with many degrees of freedom using direct connections to arrays of neurons in the motor cortex of patients with tetraplegia. Partially invasive BCI devices are implanted inside the skull but rest outside the brain rather than within the gray matter. They produce better resolution signals than non-invasive BGs where the bone tissue of the cranium deflects and deforms signals and have a lower risk of forming scar tissue in the brain than fully invasive BGs. There has been preclinical demonstration of intracortical BGs from the stroke perilesional cortex. Electrocorticography measures the electrical activity of the brain taken from beneath the skull in a similar way to non-invasive electroencephalography, but the electrodes are embedded in a thin plastic pad that is placed above the cortex, beneath the derm mater. ECOG technologies were first trialed in humans in 2004 by Eric Luthard and Daniel Moran from Washington University in St. Louis. In a later trial, the researchers enabled a teenage boy to play space invaders using his ECOG implant. This research indicates that control is rapid, requires minimal training, and may be an ideal trade-off with regards to signal fidelity and level of invasiveness. Signals can be either subdural or epidural, but are not taken from within the brain parenchyma itself. It has not been studied extensively until recently due to the limited access of subjects. Currently, the only manner to acquire the signal for study is through the use of patients requiring invasive monitoring for localization and resection of an epileptogenic focus. ECOG is a very promising intermediate BCI modality because it has higher spatial resolution, better signal to noise ratio wider frequency range, and less training requirements than scalp-recorded EEG, and at the same time has lower technical difficulty, lower clinical risk, 
and probably superior long-term stability than intracortical single neuron recording. This feature profile and recent evidence of the high level of control with minimal training requirements shows potential for real-world application for people with motor disabilities. Light reactive imaging BCI devices are still in the realm of theory. These would involve implanting a laser inside the skull. The laser would be trained on a single neuron and the neuron's reflectance measured by a separate sensor. When the neuron fires, the laser light pattern and wavelengths it reflects would change slightly. This would allow researchers to monitor single neurons but require less contact with tissue and reduce the risk of scar tissue buildup. There have also been experiments in humans using non-invasive neuroimaging technologies as interfaces. The substantial majority of published BCI work involves non-invasive EEG-based keys. Non-invasive EEG-based technologies and interfaces have been used for a much broader variety of applications. Although EEG-based interfaces are easy to wear and do not require surgery, they have relatively poor spatial resolution and cannot effectively use higher frequency signals because the skull dampens signals, dispersing and blurring the electromagnetic waves created by the neurons. EEG-based interfaces also require some time and effort prior to each usage session, whereas non-EEG-based ones, as well as invasive ones require no prior usage training. Overall, the best BCI for each user depends on numerous factors. In a recent 2016 article, an entirely new communication device and non-EEG-based human-computer interface was developed, requiring no visual fixation or ability to move eyes at all, that is based on covered interest in chosen letter on a virtual keyboard with letters each having its own circle that is micro-oscillating in brightness in different time transitions, where the letter selection is based on best fit between, on one hand, unintentional pupil size oscillation pattern, and, on the other hand, the circle in background's brightness oscillation pattern. Accuracy is additionally improved by users mental rehearsing the words bright and dark in synchrony with the brightness transitions of the circle slash letter. Electroencephalography based brain computer interfaces. Overview. In 2014 and 2017, a BCI using functional near-infrared spectroscopy for locked-in patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis was able to restore some basic ability of the patients to communicate with other people. Electroencephalography is the most studied non-invasive interface, mainly due to its fine temporal resolution ease of use, portability, and low setup cost. The technology is somewhat susceptible to noise however. Dry Active Electrode Arrays In the early days of BCI research, another substantial barrier to using EEG as a brain a Euro computer interface was the extensive training required before users can work the technology. For example, in experiments beginning in the mid-1990s, Niels Burbaumer at the University of Ta 1 4th Bingen in Germany trained severely paralyzed people to self-regulate the slow cortical potentials in their EEG to such an extent that these signals could be used as a binary signal to control a computer cursor. The experiment saw 10 patients trained to move a computer cursor by controlling their brain waves. The process was slow, requiring more than an hour for patients to write 100 characters with the cursor, while training often took many months. However, the slow cortical potential approach to BGIS has not been used in several years, since other approaches require little or no training, are faster and more accurate, and work for a greater proportion of users. Prosthesis and Environment Control 
DIY and Open Source BCI MEG and MRI BCI Control Strategies in Neurogaming Motor Imagery Bio slash neurofeedback for passive BCI designs. Visual evoked potential. Synthetic telepathy slash silent communication. Cell culture keys. Ethical considerations. Clinical and research grade BCI based interfaces. Low cost BCI based interfaces. Future Directions Disorders of Consciousness Another research parameter is the type of oscillatory activity that is measured. Burbaumer's later research with Jonathan Walpa at New York State University has focused on developing technology that would allow users to choose the brain signals they found easiest to operate a BCI, including mu and beta rhythms. A further parameter is the method of feedback used and this is shown in studies of P300 signals. Patterns of P300 waves are generated involuntarily when people see something they recognize and may allow keys to decode categories of thoughts without training patients first. By contrast, the biofeedback methods described above require learning to control brain waves so the resulting brain activity can be detected. While an EEG based brain computer interface has been pursued extensively by a number of research labs, recent advancements made by Binhe and his team at the University of Minnesota suggest the potential of an EEG based brain computer interface to accomplish tasks close to invasive brain computer interface using advanced functional neuroimaging including bold functional MRI and EEG source imaging Binhe and co-workers identified the CO variation and CO localization of electrophysiological and hemodynamic signals induced by motor imagination. Refined by a neuroimaging approach and by a training protocol, Binhe and co-workers demonstrated the ability of a non-invasive EEG-based brain-computer interface to control the flight of a virtual helicopter in three-dimensional space, based upon motor imagination. In June 2013 it was announced that Binhe had developed the technique to enable a remote control helicopter to be guided through an obstacle course. In addition to a brain-computer interface based on brain waves, as recorded from scalp EEG electrodes, Binhe and co-workers explored a virtual EEG signal-based brain-computer interface by first solving the EEG inverse problem and then used the resulting virtual EEG for brain-computer interface tasks. Well-controlled studies suggested the merits of such a source analysis-based brain-computer interface. A 2014 study found that severely motor-impaired patients could communicate faster and more reliably with non-invasive EEG BCI, than with any muscle-based communication channel. In the early 1990s Bobak Harry, at University of California, Davis demonstrated the first single and also multi-channel dry active electrode arrays using micromachining. The single-channel dry EEG electrode construction and results were published in 1994. The arrayed electrode was also demonstrated to perform well compared to silver-slash-silver -silver chloride electrodes. The device consisted of four sites of sensors with integrated electronics to reduce noise by impedance matching. The advantages of such electrodes are, no electrolyte used no skin preparation, significantly reduced sensor size, and compatibility with EEG monitoring systems. The active electrode array is an integrated system made of an array of capacitive sensors with local integrated circuitry housed in a package with batteries to power the circuitry. This level of integration was required to achieve the functional performance obtained by the electrode. 
The electrode was tested on an electrical test bench and on human subjects in four modalities of EEG activity, namely, spontaneous EEG, sensory event-related potentials, brainstem potentials, and cognitive event-related potentials. The performance of the dry electrode compared favorably with that of the standard wet electrodes in terms of skin preparation, no gel requirements, and higher signal-to-noise ratio. In 1999 researchers at Case Western Reserve University, in Cleveland, Ohio, led by Hunter Peckham, used 64 electrode EEG skullcap to return limited hand movements to quadriplegic Jim Jodic. As Jodic concentrated on simple but opposite concepts like up and down, his beta rhythm EEG output was analyzed using software to identify patterns in the noise. A basic pattern was identified and used to control a switch, above average activity was set to on, below average off. As well as enabling Jodic to control a computer cursor the signals were also used to drive the nerve controllers embedded in his hands, restoring some movement. Non-invasive keys have also been applied to enable brain control of prosthetic upper and lower extremity devices in people with paralysis. For example, Gerd Pferdskeller of Graz University of Technology and colleagues demonstrated a BCI-controlled functional electrical stimulation system to restore upper extremity movements in a person with tetraplegia due to spinal cord injury. Between 2012 and 2013, researchers at the University of California, Irvine demonstrated for the first time that it is possible to use BCI technology to restore brain-controlled walking after spinal cord injury. In their spinal cord injury research study, a person with paraplegia was able to operate a BCI robotic gait orthosis to regain basic brain-controlled ambulation. In 2009 Alex Blaney, an independent researcher based in the UK, successfully used the emotive EPOC to control a five-axis robot arm. He then went on to make several demonstration mind-controlled wheelchairs and home automation that could be operated by people with limited or no motor control such as those with paraplegia and cerebral palsy. Research into military use of BGIS funded by DARPA has been ongoing since the 1970s. The current focus of research is user-to-user -user communication through analysis of neural signals. In 2001, the Open EEG project was initiated by a group of DIY neuroscientists and engineers. The modular EEG was the primary device created the Open EEG community. It was a six-channel signal capture board that cost between $200 and $400 to make at home. The Open EEG project marked a significant moment in the emergence of DIY brain computer interfacing. In 2010, the Frontier Nerds of NYU's IDP program published a thorough tutorial titled How to Hack Toy EEGs. The tutorial, which stirred the minds of many budding DIY BCI enthusiasts, demonstrated how to create a single-channel at-home EEG with an Arduino and a Mattel MindFlex at a very reasonable price. This tutorial amplified the DIY BCI movement. In 2013, OpenBCI emerged from a DARPA solicitation and subsequent Kickstarter campaign. They created a high-quality, open-source 8-channel EEG acquisition board, known as the 32BIT board, that retailed for under $500. Two years later they created the first 3D printed EEG headset, known as the Ultra Cortex, as well as, a 4-channel EEG acquisition board, known as the Ganglion board, that retailed for under $100. In 2015, Neurotex was created with the mission of building an international network for neurotechnology.
Magnetoencephalography and functional magnetic resonance imaging have both been used successfully as non-invasive keys. In a widely reported experiment, fMRI allowed two users being scanned to play Pong in real time by altering their hemodynamic response or brain blood flow through biofeedback techniques. fMRI measurements of hemodynamic responses in real time have also been used to control robot arms with a 7 second delay between thought and movement. In 2008 research developed in the Advanced Telecommunications Research Computational Neuroscience Laboratories in Kyoto, Japan, allowed the scientists to reconstruct images directly from the brain and display them on a computer in black and white at a resolution of 10x10 pixels. The article announcing these achievements was the cover story of the journal Neuron of December 10, 2008. In 2011 researchers from UC Berkeley published a study reporting second-by-second -second reconstruction of videos watched by the study's subjects, from fMRI data. This was achieved by creating a statistical model relating visual patterns in videos shown to the subjects, to the brain activity caused by watching the videos. This model was then used to look up the 101 second video segments, in a database of 18 million seconds of random YouTube videos, whose visual patterns most closely matched the brain activity recorded when subjects watched a new video. These 101 second video extracts were then combined into a mashed up image that resembled the video being watched. Motor imagery involves the imagination of the movement of various body parts resulting in sensory motor cortex activation, which modulates sensory motor oscillations in the EEG. This can be detected by the BCI to infer a user's intent. Motor imagery typically requires a number of sessions of training before acceptable control of the BCI is acquired. These training sessions may take a number of hours over several days before users can consistently employ the technique with acceptable levels of precision. Regardless of the duration of the training session, users are unable to master the control scheme. This results in very slow pace of the gameplay. Advanced machine learning methods were recently developed to compute a subject-specific model for detecting the performance of motor imagery. The top performing algorithm from BCI Competition 4 Dataset 2 for motor imagery is the Filter Bank Common Spatial Pattern, developed by Ang Etal from A Asterisk Star, Singapore. Biofeedback is used to monitor a subject's mental relaxation. In some cases, biofeedback does not monitor electroencephalography, but instead bodily parameters such as electromyography, galvanic skin resistance, and heart rate variability. Many biofeedback systems are used to treat certain disorders such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder sleep problems in children, teeth grinding, and chronic pain. EEG biofeedback systems typically monitor four different bands and challenge the subject to control them. Passive BCI involves using BCI to enrich humana euro machine interaction with implicit information on the actual user's state, for example, simulations to detect when users intend to push brakes during an emergency car stopping procedure. Game developers using passive keys need to acknowledge that through repetition of game levels the user's cognitive state will change or adapt. Within the first play of a level, the user will react to things differently from during the second play, for example, the user will be less surprised at an event in the game if he slash she is expecting it. A VEP is an electrical potential recorded after a subject is presented with a type of visual stimuli. There are several types of VEPs. Steady state visually evoked potentials use potentials generated by exciting the retina, 
using visual stimuli modulated at certain frequencies. Seveps stimuli are often formed from alternating checkerboard patterns and at times simply use flashing images. The frequency of the phase reversal of the stimulus used can be clearly distinguished in the spectrum of an EEG, this makes detection of Seveps stimuli relatively easy. Seveps has proved to be successful within many BCI systems. This is due to several factors. The signal elicited is measurable in as large a population as the transient VEP and blink movement and electrocardiographic artifacts do not affect the frequencies monitored. In addition, the SEVEP signal is exceptionally robust, the topographic organization of the primary visual cortex is such that a broader area obtains afferents from the central or foveal region of the visual field. SEVEP does have several problems however. As SSVEPs use flashing stimuli to infer a user's intent, the user must gaze at one of the flashing or iterating symbols in order to interact with the system. It is, therefore, likely that the symbols could become irritating and uncomfortable to use during longer play sessions, which can often last more than an hour which may not be an ideal gameplay. Another type of VEP used with applications is the P300 potential. The P300 event related potential is a positive peak in the EEG that occurs at roughly 300 milliseconds after the appearance of a target stimulus or oddball stimuli. The P300 amplitude decreases as the target stimuli and the ignored stimuli grow more similar. The P300 is thought to be related to a higher level attention process or an orienting response using P300 as a control scheme has the advantage of the participant only having to attend limited training sessions. The first application to use the P300 model was the P300 matrix. Within this system, a subject would choose a letter from a grid of 6 by 6 letters and numbers. The rows and columns of the grid flashed sequentially and every time the selected choice letter was illuminated the user's P300 was elicited. However, the communication process, at approximately 17 characters per minute, was quite slow. The P300 is a BCI that offers a discrete selection rather than a continuous control mechanism. The advantage of P300 use within games is that the player does not have to teach himself slash herself how to use a completely new control system and so only has to undertake short training instances, to learn the gameplay mechanics and basic use of the BCI paradigm. In a $6.3 million Army initiative to invent devices for telepathic communication, Gerwin Schock, underwritten in a $2.2 million grant, found the use of ECOG signals can discriminate the vowels and consonants embedded in spoken and imagined words, shedding light on the distinct mechanisms associated with production of vowels and consonants and could provide the basis for brain-based communication using imagined speech. In 2002 Kevin Warwick had an array of 100 electrodes fired into his nervous system in order to link his nervous system into the Internet to investigate enhancement possibilities. With this in place Warwick successfully carried out a series of experiments. With electrodes also implanted into his wife's nervous system, they conducted the first direct electronic communication experiment between the nervous systems of two humans. Research into synthetic telepathy using subvocalization is taking place at the University of California, Irvine under lead scientist Mike D. Z. Mura. The first such communication took place in the 1960s using EEG to create Morse code using brain alpha waves. Using EEG to communicate imagined speech is less accurate than the invasive method of placing an electrode between the skull and the brain. 
On February 27, 2013 the group with Miguel Nicolelis at Duke University and IINNL successfully connected the brains of two rats with electronic interfaces that allowed them to directly share information, in the first ever direct brain-to-brain -brain interface. On September 3, 2014, direct communication between human brains became a possibility over extended distances through Internet transmission of EEG signals. In March and May 2014, a study conducted by Departamento de Psicologia General A Euro Universita de Padova, Ivan Lab A Euro Forensa, Liquid Web SRL Company and Departamento de Ingeniería e Arquitetura a Euro Universidad de Trieste, showed confirmatory results analyzing the EEG activity of two human partners spatially separated approximately 190 km apart when one member of the pair receives the stimulation and the second one is connected only mentally with the first. Researchers have built devices to interface with neural cells and entire neural networks in cultures outside animals. As well as furthering research on animal implantable devices, experiments on cultured neural tissue have focused on building problem-solving networks, constructing basic computers and manipulating robotic devices. Research into techniques for stimulating and recording from individual neurons grown on semiconductor chips is sometimes referred to as neuroelectronics or neurochips. Development of the first working neurochip was claimed by a Caltech team led by Jerome Pine and Michael Marr in 1997. The Caltech chip had room for 16 neurons. In 2003 a team led by Theodore Berger, at the University of Southern California, started work on a neurochip designed to function as an artificial or prosthetic hippocampus. The neurochip was designed to function in rat brains and was intended as a prototype for the eventual development of higher brain prosthesis. The hippocampus was chosen because it is thought to be the most ordered and structured part of the brain and is the most studied area. Its function is to encode experiences for storage as long-term memories elsewhere in the brain. In 2004 Thomas DeMars at the University of Florida used a culture of 25,000 neurons taken from a rat's brain to fly a F-22 fighter jet aircraft simulator. After collection, the cortical neurons were cultured in a petri dish and rapidly began to reconnect themselves to form a living neural network. The cells were arranged over a grid of 60 electrodes and used to control the pitch and yaw functions of the simulator. The study's focus was on understanding how the human brain performs and learns computational tasks at a cellular level. Important ethical, legal, and societal issues related to brain-computer interfacing are In their current form, most PGIs are far removed from the ethical issues considered above. They are actually similar to corrective therapies in function. Clausen stated in 2009 that a Euroabsis pose ethical challenges, but these are conceptually similar to those that bioethicists have addressed for other realms of therapy a euro. Moreover, he suggests that bioethics is well prepared to deal with the issues that arise with BCI technologies. Hayes Lager and colleagues pointed out that expectations of BCI efficacy and value play a great role in ethical analysis and the way BCI scientists should approach media. Furthermore, standard protocols can be implemented to ensure ethically sound informed consent procedures with locked-in patients. The case of PGIS today has parallels in medicine, as will its evolution. Much as pharmaceutical science began as a balance for impairments and is now used to increase focus and reduce need for sleep, PGIS will likely transform gradually from therapies to enhancements. Researchers are well aware that sound ethical guidelines, 
appropriately moderated enthusiasm in media coverage and education about BCI systems will be of utmost importance for the societal acceptance of this technology. Thus, recently more effort is made inside the BCI community to create consensus on ethical guidelines for BCI research, development, and dissemination. Some companies have been producing high-end systems that have been widely used in established BCI labs for several years. These systems typically entail more channels than the low-cost systems below, with much higher signal quality and robustness in real-world settings. Some systems from new companies have been gaining attention for new BCI applications for new user groups, such as persons with stroke or coma. Recently a number of companies have scaled back medical-grade EEG technology to create inexpensive keys. This technology has been built into toys and gaming devices, some of these toys have been extremely commercially successful like the NeuroSky and Mattel Mind Flex. A consortium consisting of 12 European partners has completed a roadmap to support the European Commission in their funding decisions for the new framework program Horizon 2020. The project, which was funded by the European Commission, started in November 2013 and ended in April 2015. The roadmap is now complete and can be downloaded on the project's web page. A 2015 publication led by Drive Clemens Brunner describes some of the analyses and achievements of this project, as well as the Emerging Brain Computer Interface Society. For example, this article reviewed work within this project that further defined keys and applications, explored recent trends, discussed ethical issues, and evaluated different directions for new keys. As the article notes, their new roadmap generally extends and supports the recommendations from the future BNCI project managed by Dr. Brendan Allison, which conveys substantial enthusiasm for emerging BCI directions. In addition to, other recent publications have explored the most promising future BCI directions for new groups of disabled users. Some prominent examples are summarized below. Some persons have a disorder of consciousness. This state is defined to include persons with coma, as well as persons in a vegetative state or minimally conscious state. New BCI research seeks to help persons with DOC in different ways. A key initial goal is to identify patients who are able to perform basic cognitive tasks, which would of course lead to a change in their diagnosis. That is, some persons who are diagnosed with DOC may in fact be able to process information and make important life decisions. Some persons who are diagnosed with DOC die as a result of end-of-life decisions, which may be made by family members who sincerely feel this is in the patient's best interests. Given the new prospect of allowing these patients to provide their views on this decision, there would seem to be a strong ethical pressure to develop this research direction to guarantee that DOC patients are given an opportunity to decide whether they want to live. These and other articles describe new challenges and solutions to use BCI technology to help persons with DOC. One major challenge is that these patients cannot use BGEs based on vision. Hence, new tools rely on auditory and slash or vibrotactile stimuli. Patients may wear headphones and slash or vibrotactile stimulators placed on the wrists, neck, leg, and slash or other locations. Another challenge is that patients may fade in and out of consciousness, and can only communicate at certain times. This may indeed be a cause of mistaken diagnosis. Some patients may only be able to respond to physicians' requests during a few hours per day and thus may have been unresponsive during diagnosis. Therefore, 
new methods rely on tools that are easy to use in field settings, even without expert help, so family members and other persons without any medical or technical background can still use them. This reduces the cost, time, need for expertise, and other burdens with doc assessment. Automated tools can ask simple questions that patients can easily answer, such as is your father named George? Or were you born in the USA? Automated instructions inform patients that they may convey yes or no by focusing their attention on stimuli on the right versus left wrist. This focused attention produces reliable changes in EEG patterns that can help determine that the patient is able to communicate. The results could be presented to physicians and therapists, which could lead to a revised diagnosis and therapy. In addition, these patients could then be provided with BCI-based communication tools that could help them convey basic needs, adjust bed position and HVAC and otherwise empower them to make major life decisions and communicate. This research effort was supported in part by different EU-funded projects, such as the Decoder Project led by Professor Andrea Kubler at the University of Würzburg. This project contributed to the first BCI system developed for doc assessment and communication, called MindBeagle. This system is designed to help non-expert users work with doc patients, but is not intended to replace medical staff. An EU-funded project that began in 2015 called ComAlert conducted further research and development to improve doc prediction, assessment, rehabilitation, and communication, called PARC in that project. Another project funded by the National Science Foundation is led by profs. Dean Krusiansky and Chong Nam. This project provides for improved vibrotactile systems, advanced signal analysis, and other improvements for doc assessment and communication. People may lose some of their ability to move due to many causes, such as stroke or injury. Several groups have explored systems and methods for motor recovery that include keys. In this approach, a BCI measures motor activity while the patient imagines or attempts movements as directed by a therapist. The BCI may provide two benefits, if the BCI indicates that a patient is not imagining a movement correctly, then the BCI could inform the patient and therapist and rewarding feedback such as functional stimulation or the movement of a virtual avatar also depends on the patient's correct movement imagery. So far, keys for motor recovery have relied on the EEG to measure the patient's motor imagery. However, studies have also used fMRI to study different changes in the brain as persons undergo BCI-based stroke rehab training. Future systems might include the fMRI and other measures for real-time control, such as functional near-infrared, probably in tandem with EEGs. Non-invasive brain stimulation has also been explored in combination with keys for motor recovery. Like the work with keys for DOC, this research direction was funded by different public funding mechanisms within the EU and elsewhere. The VIR project included work on a new system for stroke rehabilitation focused on BGIS and advanced virtual environments designed to provide the patient with immersive feedback to foster recovery. This project, and the RecoverIX project that focused exclusively on a new BCI system for stroke patients, contributed to a hardware and software platform called RecoverIX. This system includes a BCI as well as a functional electrical stimulator and virtual feedback. In September 2016, a training facility called a Recoverix Gym opened in Austria, in which therapists use this system to provide motor rehab therapy to persons with stroke. Each year, 
about 400,000 people undergo brain mapping during neurosurgery. This procedure is often required for people with tumors or epilepsy that do not respond to medication. During this procedure, electrodes are placed on the brain to precisely identify the locations of structures and functional areas. Patients may be awake during neurosurgery and asked to perform certain tasks, such as moving fingers or repeating words. This is necessary so that surgeons can remove only the desired tissue while sparing other regions, such as critical movement or language regions. Removing too much brain tissue can cause permanent damage, while removing too little tissue can leave the underlying condition untreated and require additional neurosurgery. Thus, there is a strong need to improve both methods and systems to map the brain as effectively as possible. In several recent publications, BCI research experts and medical doctors have collaborated to explore new ways to use BCI technology to improve neurosurgical mapping. This work focuses largely on high gamma activity, which is difficult to detect with non-invasive means. Results have led to improved methods for identifying key areas for movement, language, and other functions. A recent article addressed advances in functional brain mapping and summarizes a workshop. Flexible electronics are polymers or other flexible materials pentacene, PDMS, perylene, polyamide that are printed with circuitry. The flexible nature of the organic background materials allowing the electronics created to bend, and the fabrication techniques utilized to create these devices resembles those used to create integrated circuits and microelectromechanical systems. Flexible electronics were first developed in the 1960s and 1970s, but research interest increased in the mid 2000s. Motor Recovery Functional Brain Mapping Flexible Devices